All right, so now we're going to talk about other factors that influence juries. After all, this is a social psychology, right? And we got to know the social influence. And so, unfortunately, in a court of law, it's not necessarily what's, you know, what, what's right and what's wrong, but what you can convince a jury of. So, the main job of the trial lawyer is to get the jury to like the defendant. And yeah, I mean, it sounds pretty simple, but if you do happen to get pulled into a court of law for any reason, take out the earring, dude, you know? I mean... Man, you know, man, take out the earring. It just sends the wrong message, and all of a sudden, you've already got two strikes against you. Um, attractive defendants have been shown to get few, you know, lower penalties. And by attractive, of course, part of that is the lawyer's job is to make you know you likable and attractive. But look at this. Here's judges, and this is Texas. Of course, it is right. Texas, where we're proud that our judges are conservative. A judge is supposed to be independent from the political system, all right? That's just, ugh, drives me nuts. Okay, so what happened was that um, when it came to minor, moderate, or serious offenses, that the less attractive they were, if you take a look, the bail is set higher. You get higher bail if you're less attractive than if you're highly attractive. Wow, okay? Participants are given a story about another student caught cheating and what kind of penalty should we give that student and if it had an attractive photo, it was, was a smaller penalty. Or here, I love this uh, good old far side. So I ask you, jury, is that the face of a mass murderer? <laughs> All right, whatever. Okay, so um, as we say here, witnesses that are more confident um, tend to be more influential. And, and of course, this isn't just in a, in a court of law. In any situation, confidence really works. Okay? Defendants similar to the jury tend to get easier treatment. And so, yeah, there's, there's something to be said. I mean, depending on what your perhaps race might be, you might want to make sure that the jury somehow matches you. Um, defendants that have previous convictions are much less likable. You, you can't, it, it's hard to sell that to a jury. Um, and juries, as I've already stated, once something, once a piece of evidence has been put out there, the judge can say all day long, you know, ignore that, in fact, but they can't. They can't. Like in rape cases, it's illegal to consider the previous history of the victim, but yet juries can't ignore it. So once the information is out of the bag, it's in, it's in the jury's mind, okay? So you just won't get anything. And as much as people don't think so, pre-trial publicity is also impossible to ignore. Um, very interesting. Once people form, and this is this is more of a cognitive thing, but yet it's so true here in in a, in a courtroom. Once people form a probabilities, and this is just in anywhere probabilities. Once you have an estimation of probability, I think the probability that an event will occur is it's going to take an awful lot of information to change your opinion on that. Okay, It's kind of a version of first impressions really matter. And so if the jury comes in and already believes a certain type of person is usually bad, and all of a sudden it is that certain type of person that is up is being being charged that person has to put an a lot of positive evidence to sway that opinion because it's just it's the, it's a, a notion of the first impression thing so wow um in another set of studies what they did was um here it's under my head again um, they, you know, so a jury finds a defendant guilty, and so now the jurors are read possible um, crimes. Is the uh, convicted offender, I don't know, guilty of first-degree murder, second-degree murder, unintentional homicide, or negligent manslaughter? Okay? And so that is from harshest to least harsh. Well, if you do the exact opposite and start with manslaughter... Um, if you start with manslaughter, then people give a smaller penalty. If you start with first-degree murder, they get a larger penalty. And this is, again, a real cognitive uh, psychology thing. It's called anchoring, that we tend to anchor on the first thing we hear and see, and all judgments from then on will be based on the first anchor that were, were there. 
Um, sometimes the victim, if the victim has a criminal record, jurors tend not to be sympathetic. But you know what? Situations can make jurors sympathetic, like Bernie Getz. You guys are um, way too young for this. But boy, was this a really big deal. Right around 80-something. What year? Here, oh, do I jump? Bernie Getz, I don't have it written here. It's about 1984, 1985, something. So Bernie Getz, right? He had been mugged on the subway, and he just had enough. So he goes onto the subway with a gun, and he basically, see, now, I, I remember going on the subways in the, in the mid-90s, and um, I was told, I, I went with a, a native New Yorker, and here was, his, here was his advice, all right? He's just like, when you get on the subway, you look at the floor and do not make eye contact with anyone because that is how you get in trouble on the subway. And I'm like, wow, you live like this on a regular basis. Well, Bernie Getz was just sick and tired of living like this. And so he gets on the subway and he basically creates a confrontation with three young black men. And he just basically looks him in the eye. And then, of course, they come and try to take his wallet. And he says, yeah. Yeah, you want a wallet? Boom, and shoot some. And it turned out um, a really, really big deal. And so he shoots them, and um, I, I think he crippled one or something. One was in a wheelchair forever and stuff. And then, you know, Bernie Gatz was like, is he a hero, right? Because, you know, these thugs on the subway or something like this. Or is he, you know, a vigilante going out and creating the crime? And then it didn't help at all that one of the um, accused that was supposed to be a victim, right? One of the accused uh, boys that were supposed to be a victim then gets caught like um, just a, a violent raping a 10-year-old two weeks later or something. It was just nuts. So all of a sudden, they, they're like, yeah, Bernie Guest, you're guilty. You did, in fact, commit this crime. But we sympathize with you, wink, wink. And he, um, I don't even remember what happened. I don't think he even went to jail for that. But man, was that big trial news. I should look that up. No, not me. You should look that up. All right, very cool. Um, so part of the problems is that the individual jurors, there's a lot of individual differences. And so what happens is that the instructions that are read uh, may not be comprehended. Because again, this is a jury of your peers, and you're going to get a whole wide range of intellect and whatnot coming in to, to the jury. And so all of a sudden, the legalese or the standard of proof. Now, perhaps you've heard, you know, uh, you must be convinced of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. But somebody else might use clear and convincing evidence or preponderance. I mean, all of these different phrases that don't really have meaning. Okay, what does beyond a reasonable doubt even mean? I I don't I don't know what that is beyond a reasonable doubt. What is reasonable? Okay. And so, all of a sudden, we find that the American judicial system does, in fact, require juries to presume innocence. So, a defendant is innocent unless you can determine guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, this is a problem because, again, going back to a, a very, very uh, fundamental co uh, concept, concept in cognitive psychology, people are almost always more confident than they are correct. And so the confidence that they feel about the judgment they're going to pass is going to be far higher than the truth of that judgment. Um, attorneys can use scientific jury selection. This is a good movie right here, The Runaway Jury. I don't know how true it is, but I guess it's, I mean, this is John Grisham, and he does his homework, okay? He really does. And I know it's a Hollywood Hollywood movie here, right? But he does his homework. And it's kind of a scary thought how much um, jury selection can be. Because, again, you need to get um, a jury to like the defendant, okay? So asking the jurors opinions about drug use, you know, oh, what do you what do you think about drug use? Will really give you insight into how they might react to a drug trafficking charge. Or people they'll they'll ask the, you know, they'll give them a series of questionnaires and one of them will be like, you know, do you put faith in the testimony of psychiatry? And people say no to that. All of a sudden, you're like, if I thought I was going to do an insanity defense, I don't want this guy on my jury, okay? Because he clearly has already stated that he doesn't 
or she, <laughs> does not hold much faith in that. Well, kind of an interesting thing here, group polarization. So they did this realistic simulation of a murder trial, and they took jurors, and what they did was they had them deliberate for a while. And so we see the pinkish lines is their verdict is at the beginning of deliberation, their initial, when they walk into deliberations and they're thinking, what might this be? What might be happening? And you see you've got some undecided, some that thought not guilty, some that thought manslaughter, etc. But then what happened is they deliberated, you see that they clustered a lot more. You see at the beginning, the, the, uh, the pink lines are pretty spread out. But by the time you get to the orange lines, the verdict itself after deliberation, we see that group polarization in action, right? They pretty much polarized on the same result. However, what's interesting is that, um, that um, you know, we talked about minority influence. And so if you have, you know, 11 jurors that think innocent and one that thinks guilty, they're going to have a really, really, really hard time convincing the 11 because, again, those 11 are walking in with the unless, you know, uh, wait, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And so, therefore, the 11 innocent are far more likely to hold their position. But if you flip the opposite and you had one innocent and 11 guilty, then all of a sudden it, it would be easier, it'd still be hard, easier for that one innocent to pull the other 11 back, if you can imagine such a thing, because jurors do truly take this notion of, um, you must demonstrate guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, to heart. And by the way, this, uh, this whole idea comes from William Blakestone, uh, British, by the way. It is better that 10 guilty persons escape than one innocent suffer. And this is clearly a British concept, but it's clearly made its way into American law with the proof beyond a reasonable doubt idea. Um, how about this? When a group makes a decision, is the decision better? And I can tell you, I mean, just from other, I, I, I'm sure I had it in one of the lectures earlier, but as a reminder that um, the average correctness of a group of people is better than the average correctness of all the individuals. However, inevitably there will be an individual in the group that is better than the group average. Okay? If that makes any sense. So the group as an average gets better than the average of the individuals, but there will always be an individual who would have, would have been better than what the average is at the end. So, what we find is that um, often group uh, juries come to an average opinion, and you know, from a basic idea of uh, just the average is better. I mean, if you want to know the, I mean, this is a fundamental con characteristic of statistics. If you want to know the truth, you go and look. Except you don't look at one person, for example, because one person, a lot of things could happen. So you look at two people, three people, four people, ten people, a hundred people, and you average them all together. And the average of a hundred observations is far more likely to reflect the truth than any one observation alone could possibly be. Okay? All right, great. So now we just got one more topic left to round out this course, and so we'll just chop to that pretty soon.